We're glad that you're here and pray that you're encouraged. Uh, Youth Sunday today, and I've got some young folks involved in the service. I think you'll enjoy that. But first and foremost, Wednesday night we had the honor of baptizing into Christ a young woman named Janet Flowers, and uh, I want to present her with her Bible and her certificate. Come on up, Janet. You stay right there, okay? Let's have a prayer. Our Father God in heaven, you are holy, and we praise you for the truth of your word. Father, we thank you for Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for Janet and for the rest of us that are in Christ. We pray your hand of blessing on her as she lives and serves for you each and every day of her life. Help us as a church to surround her with love and encouragement and accountability. And Father, together may we continue to advance the cause of Christ in this community. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all here today. Uh, If you're new or visiting with us, uh, in the seat in front of you, there should be a welcome card. If you would, fill that out, and you can hand it to any of the gentlemen at the door when you leave or put it in the offering box at the back of the foyer. That way we can get to know you a little bit better. A couple announcements before I begin. So elder deacon meeting next Sunday, and that'll be after the morning service. And good news, camp is back on. So Camp Wakatomica 2020 will happen. Uh, The only change to the most recent schedule is that junior week, grades 6 through 8, has been moved to July 26th through the 31st. Registrations are available online and in the foyer. Put them in the Steve Mux mail folder, and they need to be turned in at Millwood by this Wednesday in order to get your free t-shirt. All right, so I'm gonna start off uh, with a scripture reading real quick. I'll be reading from Mark 10, verses 13 through 16. It says, and they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, permit the children to come to me, do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands upon them. Today is uh, our youth Sunday. You'll notice that our youth here will be serving in every aspect of our service that we are performing today. And it's been said by some that our youth are the future of the church. Here we believe they are the church. They worship with us each and every day. They sing along with us. And we hold high regards to our youth and the knowledge that they possess and just working to make stronger disciples of them. Um, We're going to begin by honoring our seniors that we have today. Uh, I'm going to list their names out real quick here. Uh, Some aren't with us due to traveling and other things. Um, But then we've got a short video that we'll play for you, and then I'll award each one of them with a small gift from the church. So their names are Abigail Buckingham, Brian Hockenberry, Cece Newbold, Emma Merriman, Regan Jones, Emily Odu, and Savannah Bateman. Just kind of knowing how to work with my hands and work and kind of earn earn what you get from life. 
I would have to say definitely my parents because just that them bringing me up in the church and teaching me life lessons with working could definitely be my biggest influence. I would definitely say my parents because we've had many, many talks at home about me especially being in public school, being raised in the church, how I'm supposed to act, what I should be doing to live spiritually and show people around me who I really am. Definitely my parents, like they all said, being raised in the church was a big factor in who I am and they just really encouraged me to live a life seeking Jesus. I want my parents for sure. They're just great. I'm just going to this and everything that they've done. married honestly that's my goal for life right now so that's what I'm thinking probably working maybe married we'll see but just probably still involved here at Melwood or somewhere else in five years I hope to have a steady job steady life my parents tell me not to get married too young <laughs> so I'm not too sure about that one but hopefully having a job and making good life choices. I see myself graduating from college, have a steady job, and who knows, maybe a boyfriend. Hopefully I'm in med school and haven't flunked out of college, which I don't see happening. And maybe be in, be in a relationship, maybe working towards getting married, and hopefully be able to get a steady job afterwards. I think, honestly, it's really important to have a schedule. Being able to kind of fit everything in, making sure you make time for your spiritual, for spiritual work, reading your Bible, just kind of understanding everything. You just need to make time with that because life can be really busy, especially through college when you have papers and other assignments that might be due. It just, it's really important to make sure that you really focus on making sure that there's enough time to do everything. I want to be able to find a good church at college and get involved there um, during my two years there, and I want to be able to re read through the whole Bible. I'm going to be staying home and commuting to and from school, so I'll have the opportunity to stay here at Millwood and continue coming with my family, so that's going to be a huge plus. But a goal of mine is to read fully through the New Testament, something I've been trying to do, but I'll get a couple chapters in and stop, so I really want to fully get through that. Just digging into the scriptures deeper and becoming more involved here at Millwood or somewhere else. I'd say staying cons consistent and growing deeper in my faith. Definitely just kind of experiencing college fully, just going to classes, kind of getting to know some different people. And especially uh, since I'll be doing track still in college, that'll be kind of nice getting to getting to travel a little bit and getting to know my teammates and getting to have some good friends, hopefully, that'll carry out uh, on after college. I'm looking forward to having a little freedom. I've always lived by every single family member. <laughs> so that'll be nice having some freedom and not having three moms around, so. I'm looking forward to making new friends. Although I love my friends from high school, I'm learning to make some new ones and more memories. I'm excited to get more education and meet more people, and then I'm also excited to work too. I think that'll be a good experience. I'm excited to experience life, and I want to go on adventures. So my favorite memory from Millwood would probably be the video that I still have on my phone. 
of BBS back at the old church when Zach Braeburn did a swan dive into a cardboard box and ended up rolling on his head. My favorite memory would be before we built the new church building and just having like all the members gather around this area and with our shovels and just getting to see the new ground. My favorite memory is from church camp and I'm going to have to give a shout out to Marlene because I was like 13 years old on my top bunk and she was below me. She was my cabin mom and the whole night long I was bent over all the blood rushing to my head and we were just talking about life and that stuck with me to this day. For me at Melwood, I feel like the Bible, but there's a lot of great members of the Bible and for camp probably could read. I don't think I have just one favorite experience. I've enjoyed just about everything at camp and here. and my sister and her husband and kids. Seniors would come up front, please.
All right, uh, let's give these guys one more round of applause. Uh, just a quick reminder, uh, if you didn't see, uh, communion cups are available uh, at the door where you entered the foyer. If you didn't grab that, feel free to run and grab that now, and we'll continue with our normal worship service. Thank you.
Hebrews 9, 25 through 28 says, Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But, but as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. In the Old Testament, high priests would offer animal sacrifices for the sins of people once a year. But that changed when Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for our sins, putting an end to animal sacrifices for sins. When Jesus went to the cross and conquered death, he not only saved us from our sins, but he also gave us the hope of spending eternity in heaven with him. This is why we come together every Sunday, to remember Jesus and his sacrifice. The bread represents his body and the juice represents his blood. Let's pray. Dear God, you are loving and gracious towards us, and we thank you for that. Please help us to stay focused on you and everything we do. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. If you have an offering, you can put it in the box at the back of the room. Let's pray. Dear God, I pray that as we give today, we'll give joyful hearts, knowing that this offering will further your kingdom. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. so much we have lost as we look down the road where all the prodigals have walked one by one the enemy has whispered lies and led them off as slaves but we know
So Judges chapter 16, uh, and I think before we get started, we should really spend some time and uh, appreciate what the young people have done here this morning. Uh, I kept staring at their legs, and you know what I noticed? None of them were doing that. They came up here and they were confident, and I think the reason they were confident is because of the love and support that you guys have shown for them. So you can see the name of the sermon this morning is, Have You Made Your Appointment? So what... Uh, Once you're in Judges 16, we're going to talk about a story, and then we're going to get in there. So just hold your spot, and then we'll get to that at the end. Uh, But starting off with the story, uh, growing up, one of uh, my parents' favorite things to do was tell me the story about how I was born. An angel came to my mother while she was working in the field and said, you are going to bear a child. He's going to be a Nazarite and a judge. And ever since then, my parents would tell me this story. And when I was born, because I was my uh, mother's only child, she was barren, you see. I was my mother's only child. Uh, she called me Samson, which stands for son. You know, uh, like, like um, you know, son is light. So you can almost imagine the Beatles song, here comes the sun, do, do, do. Or, you know, uh, this little light of mine. I'm not sure which one my parents were singing at my birth, but they named me Samson. And I told you that I was a Nazarite and a judge. Well, now what a judge was is someone who would judge the nation, right? They would judge those who are going against God. And at this time in history, uh, our people, the Jews, are under uh, captivity of the Philistines. We are their slaves. We are bonded to them. And my specific job, being Samson, was to judge the Philistines and show them God's wrath and his righteousness and hopefully lead the nation of Israel to repentance in the meantime. And then a Nazarite in all this, a Nazarite was someone who consecrated themselves to the Lord. They devoted themselves uh, to God. And one thing that, or there's three things that a Nazarite can't do. So if you go to Numbers chapter six, uh, you don't have to turn there, but there's really three things that could be summed up in that. And, uh, uh-huh. wait a minute. Uh-huh. So the three things that a Nazarite can't do is touch or be around a dead body. We can't eat or drink anything with grapes in it. And finally, we can't cut our hair. Now, when you think of this, it kind of seems odd, right? Uh, I could almost see why I couldn't touch or be around a dead body because according to the law of Moses, that would make me unclean. But I couldn't attend a funeral. Uh, I could see why eating or drinking something with grapes in it Uh, would make me unholy because of the drunkenness that can come from wine. But one thing I don't understand and I never understood is this. Why can't I get a haircut? Now, we all felt the frustration over the past few months of not being able to get a haircut because of COVID. I went my whole life without getting a haircut. A long time. It was probably down to my knees just swooshing around as I'm walking, getting knotted up. I run through the briars and my hair's back here. I did not get a haircut my whole life because if I cut my hair, I can no longer be a Nazarite. So I couldn't attend a funeral. I couldn't eat raisins and I couldn't get a haircut. Now, truly, I didn't understand why I couldn't get a haircut. Like I said, I could come up with a conclusion why I couldn't do the other two, but why, God, can I not get a haircut? And then I learned why. And the reason or the way that I learned is by a woman named Delilah. And I would soon realize what is in a haircut. And the way I met Delilah is quite an interesting story, let me tell you. It all starts when I go down to a town called Timna. And there she was, the freshest flower I'd ever smelt, the apple of my eye, a cool glass of lemonade on a hot summer day. And my buddies come to me and go, hey, this girl's single. You can get her. So I go home. I said, Dad, I want that one right down there. And Dad goes and he gets her and I get married to this girl. But there was one issue, right? There's always an issue in a young relationship. She was a Philistine. One of the very people that I was supposed to judge. And believe it or not, that didn't go well with my parents. My dad says, what are you doing? They hate God. They hate God's people. They're going to try to kill you. And my only response was, but she's pretty. 
That's the only thing I could say. And actually, if you read my response, the Bible says, she looks good to me. That's the only thing that she had going for, but I was in love. There was the chills from my back clear down to my toes. I was in love, and I would not be separated from her. I wanted this girl. Uh, and what ended up happening is we get married, and it only took seven days, seven days, one full week. And what happened is she went behind my back. She went behind me. She talked to my friends. And I got so mad. I was, I was just so angry that I stormed away. But I wish that was all I did. I did two things that broke, to break that vow before this all happened. Uh, coming to this wedding, I kill a lion. The spirit of the Lord came on me. And I was super strong and I killed a lion. And then because of all these 30 people, all these friends that went behind my back with my wife, I killed 30 people that day also. I had not only been around or touched a dead body, I had caused there to be dead bodies. I had broke my Nazarite vow. And uh, because of this, I'm so mad, I storm off to my dad's house. And then a little while later, I, I feel guilty. I go and I talk to this lady and I'm trying to make things right. And I visit the father-in-law uh, and he says, no, you can't come in here. I uh, didn't think he liked her anymore, so I married her to someone else. And what I found out in that moment is not only had uh, someone married my wife, one of my close friends had married my wife. And in anger, what I did is I got 300 foxes. You, you know how hard it is to catch 300 foxes? I catch 300 foxes. And I tie their tails together and I put a torch in there. I said, I'll show you guys. And I let them loose in the wheat fields and this dry wheat catches a blaze. And the whole harvest is gone. And here I am. And I thought I proved my point, right? I go, <laughs> you'll never do that again. But what happened is isn't what I was expecting. I was just trying to prove a point, but what ended up happening is the Philistines were so mad that their harvest was gone, they were trying to figure out who's responsible. And what they did is they burned my wife and my father-in-law alive in their own house. And this made me so angry, so I ran away. I run and I run and I run because I can still remember the screams, and I keep trying to run away from them. I find myself in a cave. And eventually what happens here as my brothers and sisters, you know, my, the other Jewish brethren are so uh, pressured because what happens, these Philistines, the ones that killed the wife and the uh, father-in-law, they had gone to Judah, one of the biggest cities that we had. And there's thousands of them there. There's a thousand. And they say, bring us Samson. That guy who's killing us, bring him here. So my brethren come to me. They find me and they say, Samson, you've got to come. Samson, we need you to come. The Philistines are looking for you and they're going to kill us if we don't deliver you. And I understand where they're coming from. I didn't have any issue with that because uh, they had families like I wished to one day have. And I didn't want anything to happen to those families. So I came. Even though I had the power to slay them all, I allow them to bind me and I come with them. And then as they lead me into Judah, I see a thousand Philistines. 1,000 people that want me dead, no matter the cost. They're seeking vengeance through my blood. And at that moment, the Spirit of the Lord comes on me, so I break the ropes that are holding my wrists together. And they all start to run at me. You can imagine what 1,000 people are you know, running after you looks like. I, I, I don't know what to do, so I'm, I'm scurrying around, uh, trying to find a weapon to defend myself. You know what I find? The jawbone of a donkey. And I use this jawbone and I slay that day a thousand Philistines. I walked off that field alone, victorious. I had broke my Nazarite vow again. I went from killing a lion to killing 30 people to slaughtering a thousand. And I didn't even notice how far I was getting away from God. It just kept going and going and going. I took one step after the next and before long, I found myself in a field of blood. I find it interesting how it's easier uh, 
and easier and easier to break our vows with God, just like I had broke my Nazarite vow. And in the course of this, I, I, for the next little while of my life, I start playing a game of chase with the Philistines. Uh, they follow me. I mess around. I sneak away. Sometimes I kill them. Sometimes whatever happens, i just playing chase with these guys. And in this course of this big game of chase I'm playing throughout my life, I find a woman. <laughs> there she is again. The second love of my life. Guess what her name was? Delilah. I, when I met Delilah, I said, you've got to be kidding me. I saw the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen my whole life, and she died. But here I am, the most beautiful girl I will ever see. And I saw her twice. I said, I am a lucky man. God has brought to me two of the most beautiful women I have ever seen in my life. But there was an issue with this one, too. She also, like the first was a Philistine, one who was against God and against God's people. But that didn't stop me the first time. Why would it stop me the, the second time, right? Uh, I, I just kind of rationalized in my head. I said, well, the only reason why the first one didn't work out is, is because all the outside forces. It wasn't anything about her being a Philistine. It, it was just all the people outside. And I said, this one would be different. Delilah is going to be different. She's going to treat me good. She's going to love me. She's going to care for me. She's going to do what's best for me. It's what I thought at the time. And uh, I became so close that I felt like I could open up to her and I could tell her anything. That's how Samson felt. That's how I felt with the lion. My enemy, the Philistines, had heard about this new love that I had found and they sought to use her against me. The biggest weapon they could find, they, they, they were trying to figure out how could they capture this and use it as a weapon to destroy me. And I had never expected that they would use the love of my life against me. What happened is they offered her money, a lot of money. And they said, if you deliver Samson to us, we will pay you. I never dreamed that. And not only had I never dreamed they would ever do that, I had also never dreamed that she would accept it. Even if she was offered, I didn't think she would truly accept it. I would learn that sometimes you don't have to dream about something for it to come true. I told you we're going to go ahead and turn to Judges chapter 16. So uh, Judges chapter 16 here. Give you a second to turn back to that. Judges 16. And then we're going to read verse 6 through 9. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength is and how you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, If they bind me with seven fresh cords that have not been dried, then I will become weak and like any other man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh cords that had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now she had men lying in wait in the inner room, and she said to them, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the cords as a string of toe snaps, and when it touches fire, so his strength was not yet discovered. So they binded me, right? I, I was so blinded by love in this moment, I didn't realize what had happened. Uh, Delilah says, So, uh, you know, Samson, just curious, uh, if someone wanted to afflict you and steal your strength, how hypothetically would one do so? So I'd tell her, tie me with seven straps, seven leather straps. And guess what happens? I wake up that night, and guess what's on my hands? Seven leather straps. Coincidence, right? And then guess what else happened? She says, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Wow. Amazing. What a coincidence. She asked, I answer wrongly, and here I am, strapped down with Philistines running in. But it wasn't an issue because I lied to her, and because I lied to her, I was able to snap the straps, and I was able to slay the Philistines. So not a big issue, right? It, it a buff. It's okay. Well, 
I wish I had paid attention to why she wanted to know how to steal my strength. Verse six, and how you may be bound to what? Someone shouted out to afflict me. Her purpose from the get-go was to afflict, not to help. I thought, I was optimistic, but she said, how may I bind you to afflict you? Not to help you, but to afflict you. Like I said, I was blinded. Delilah had blinded me. Now turn to Judges 16, verse 10 through 12. Just the next few verses here. Then Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you have deceived me and told me lies. Now please tell me how you may be bound. He said to her, If they bind me tightly with new ropes, which have not been used, then I will become weak and like any other man. Okay. Uh, so soon later, Delilah does this same thing, right? It, it's probably not like it's a month. It may have been the next day. Delilah comes to me and says, how can I bind you? You lied to me. How dare you? You jerk. You know, right? Because uh, it's kind of like a banana calling someone yellow. Uh, she says, how can I bind you? So I said, well, tie me up with some new ropes. So guess what happens that night? I tell her this, and guess what is on my hands when I wake up? magically, there's some new ropes on my hands. And guess what she says? Samson, the Philistines are upon you. She could have at least changed the way she said it. She hid them in the same room, said the same exact things, and here I am, coincidentally, tied up the way I told only her to tie me up. Coincidence, right? but I was blinded. I'm having issues with my side. Okay, here we go. I must have bumped it. So then Judges, verse 13 through 14. Same thing happens again. Let's read it. Then Delilah said to Samson, up to now you have deceived me and told me lies. Tell me how you may be bound. And he said to her, if you weave the seven locks of my hair in the web and fasten it with a pen, then I will become weak, just like any other man. So while he slept, Delilah took the seven locks of his hair and wove them into the web. And she fastened it to the pen and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled out the pen of the loom in the web. She asked me again. Here I am a third time. But I'm blinded. She asked me a third time. Quit lying to me, sweetie. I, I just want to know how to steal your strength. Well, every time I tell you, you try to kill me. You know, you crazy. Um, maybe that's why dad said don't marry a Philistine. I don't know. Uh, but here I am. I tell her, well, if you get my braids, you weave them into a loom, then my strength will be gone. I can't even believe she bought that. Doesn't even sound right, right? But she buys it. And you know what happens? I wake up that night, guess where my hair is? Seven locks, weaved into a loom, held in with a pen. Amazing. Coincidence. And here comes the Philistines. But I was blinded. It's amazing how things like that work. And then here's the, the sad part of my story. Judges, chapter 16, verse 15 through 21. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have deceived me three times and have not told me where your great strength is. And it came about when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him that his soul was annoyed to death. <laughs> you like how I put that in there? His soul was annoyed to death. So he told her all that was in his heart and said to her, a razor has never come to my head for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. And if I am shaved, then my strength will leave me and I will become weak like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all that was within his heart, he sent and, he called, and she called to the lords of the Philistines saying, come up once more for he has told me all that is in his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money out of their hands and she made him sleep on her knees and called for a man and had shaved off the seven locks of his hair. Then she began to afflict him and his strength left him. 
She said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as any other time and shake myself free. But he had not known. I had not known the Lord had departed me. Then the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze chains. And there he was a grinder in the prison. So here we are, the fourth and final time. And this time I went too far. I want you to notice a few phrases found in this passage that we read, but maybe we looked over. I told her my deepest secret. I opened up to her. I showed her every square inch of my inner being. And as soon as she saw that I told her all that was in my heart, she took advantage of me and she cut my hair. I thought this time would be like every time before. I thought I would just break free, break loose of the bindings, destroy my enemy. But this time there was something different. I want you to notice this. He did not know the Lord had departed him. It was a standard day in the life of Samson. But little did he know that day the Lord was no longer with him. At that point, instead of giving his whole heart to God, he gave his whole heart to Delilah. I learned that day that God won't play a a game of chase like that with you. He wants you to want all of him. And if you give yourself to someone else, something else, the Lord will depart as it had with I. I became so blinded, get this, blinded by Delilah that I didn't even realize God, the creator, the master, uh, the alpha and the mega had left me. I eventually uh, paid for this by becoming a prisoner and ultimately in my death. Verse 19, pay attention to this. She made him sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his hair. Then she began to afflict him and his strength left him. I want you to to look at something interesting here. Where was I sleeping? Go ahead, shout out. Where was I sleeping? You know what that means? We were cuddling. I fell asleep on her, the most vulnerable I could have been. I opened up my heart, I fall asleep on her, and it's while I'm in my most vulnerable stage that she had brought me to, she cuts my hair. It's at this point, it's at this point where my strength was gone. My hair was laying on the ground. And who began to afflict me? She did, Delilah. It wasn't just the Philistines. It was Delilah, the one who I had become blinded by, the one who I had trusted with my whole heart. She began to afflict him. Now, hearing the story, you probably have thoughts like, well, you should have seen that coming, Samson. But I have this to say to you all this morning. This is exactly what God sees when he looks down and he looks at our life. We see Samson, Delilah. God sees us in Delilah. The frustration that comes from hearing this story, from all the obvious steps that he took wrong and steps that Samson should have took, God looks down and can see with us. He knows our Delilah. He knows when we open up our whole heart to him. And I have to say, this sermon isn't original with me. I heard about this idea, but it's too good not to preach. He knows about our Delilah. And the Delilah in your life, this is the lesson. So listen, if you only hear one part, the Delilah that is in your life, she will cut your hair. She will steal your strength. She will begin to afflict you. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, a scripture that we're all familiar with. For the wage of sin is death. Is the wage of sin life? Everybody shake your head no. Big no. The wage of sin is death. I learned that. The wage of my committing adultery with God led in my imprisonment And then ultimately, my death. The wage of sin is death. Sin leads to death, not life. Your enemy, Satan, we all have an enemy here. Your enemy, Satan, knows exactly 
how to use your Delilah against you. He knows what your Delilah is and he knows the steps that he can take to make you fall into Delilah's snare. First Peter chapter five, verse eight. It's the NIV version. Be alert. This is speaking to Christians, this is speaking to us. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a lion, a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Satan knows how to use Delilah. Now, I love interaction in a sermon. And the way we're going to do interaction this morning is a little different than the way we normally do it. Instead of shouting out what I want you to do, is when I do the obvious cue, I want you to say, she will cut your hair. But I, I don't want you to yell. I just want you to say, it. she will cut your hair. You guys ready? So I say uh, something, something, something. You say, she will cut your hair. Something, something, something else. She will cut your hair. Uh, blah, 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 blah. She will cut your hair. We get it? Okay. If you are watching porn, she will cut your hair. if you are gossiping, she will cut your hair. if you are lying, if you are looking at Delilah instead of God, what did we learn here this morning? She will cut your hair. Delilah is sin. The Philistines is Satan. Satan will use Delilah against us. Sin doesn't care about where you're going. Doesn't care about how hard he can make life for you. Sin has one objective, and that is to do his master's bidding, Satan. That's his one goal in life. And we need to be careful that we don't give our hearts over to Delilah because she will cut your hair. And I want to say this, and uh, elders, preachers, uh, deacons, faithful men of God, faithful women of God, uh, I want you to give me a big nod yes if you agree with this statement. If there is someone in here, and I guarantee everybody in here is applied, me also, if there is someone in here who has a Delilah in their life, we want you, we as your brothers and sisters in Christ, as, as your leaders, as, as the shepherds, we want you to do this one thing. Come to us. Come to us. Now this is the part I want you to nod your head on. Christians, leaders, would we rather that someone come and confess a sin, no matter how bad it may be to us, or would we rather them have their hair cut? Nod your head yes if you want them to come to you before their hair's cut. We want people to be able to confess to us. We don't want them to be destroyed. We're all in this together. We all have a Delilah. We all have little things, little skeletons in the closet. You can come to us. We can help each other. What point is the body of Christ if we can't help one another? What point is the body of Christ if we can't help one another? And then this is the final message, the final statement, and then we're going to get into an invitation. You have two options in life, because everyone here has a Delilah, so you have two options. Either you keep feeding into Delilah, and you keep getting closer and closer and closer with it, and she will, steal your, she will cut your hair and she will steal your strength, or, this is the option I hope you take, or you can cut her out of your life. Which one do you want? I so said we're going to offer an invitation. This morning, um, maybe you have a Delilah in your life that you need help getting rid of. And if you don't want to come forward, I understand you can come to us and, and deal with it one-on-one -on -one and we'll be here to help you. And we're not going to kick you out of church because you're gossiping or anything like that. We're going to try to help you, right? Uh, but if you're in this life, and you feel like Satan's puppet, you feel like a, a, a puppeteer for Satan, I, I, I'd encourage you to come forward this morning. There's no reason to have a Delilah in your life. There's no reason to have sin in your life. That's what Christ died on that cross to set us free from. So stand with me. And if you accept that, if you haven't accepted that before and you want to accept that this morning, we invite you to come forward during the song.
Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, does someone have a closing prayer? Okay. Well, bow your heads. We're going to pray, and uh, we hope to see you next week. Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day that you blessed us with. We are thankful, Lord, for this message this morning. And pray, Father, that we all uh, maintain our focus each and every day, that that focus is on you and that we reject sin in our lives, and that we lean on each other for help and, and come to one another when in need. Uh, I pray, Father, for all of our youth in this uh, congregation, uh, the excellent job they did today. We're proud of them and very thankful for them and can just ask that uh, our, those numbers continue to grow and that their strength in you continues to grow, Lord. Be with each one of us as we depart from this place. Uh, give us a safe week and rejoin us here on the next Lord's Day with a happy heart full of love for you. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.